welcome back to This Is Life Unfiltered. I'm your host, Alexa Curtis. And if you have been listening to all of the Fearless Every Day on Radio Disney so far, I hope you guys have been loving every episode. I'm really glad that I've had the chance to talk to so many young entrepreneurs and so many incredible young kids on that show, as well as keep This Is Life Unfiltered going. So if you aren't following This Is Life or myself on social media, check us out at, at This Is Life Podcast. And my personal social media is at Alexa under Square Curtis. Today I've got a guest on who was highly recommended to me by multiple people and I never get like this many DMs in a row about like who to get on a podcast. So today I've got Houston Craft on. Thank you for being here with me today. I like it. I like that people like me. That's nice. Yeah. Well, you have started two really incredible companies. You're 29. You're originally from Maine. So East Coast is the best coast. I'm convinced. <laughs> but tell me everything, like how you got into doing so much good in this world. Hmm. Well, working on doing good in the world, um, you know, a lot of what I do revolves around like the premise of everything is that our life is relational, right? Like whether we like it or not, we, it's our relationship to our family, our friends, ourselves. And I've been just really lucky that like, uh, between family who is crazy supportive, maybe sometimes like aggressively supportive, um, between friends who inspire me consistently and mentors who have like taught me, you know, what it means to what, what, what good looks like in the world. Um, I, I do what I do today in large part because I've just been inspired by lots of other people who do this work well. You're um, incredibly humble. That's what I really like automatically just after meeting you is for 29, you're so successful and you just got this humble personality about you. But take me back to like high school, even college, mm. you went to a small college right in Maine. Mm-hmm. And what, how did those experiences shape you to create character strong and choose love? Mm. Take you back to high school. Uh, not everyone wants to go back there. I, we were just having this conversation with friends the other day of like, what was like the low point? of just your, your style and like, what did you get into that you regret a little bit? And my sophomore year of high school, I wore pajamas every day. I had long hair, but I don't have like flowy surfer hair. It's like thick. So it was kind of like more helmety. Um, so I don't always love to go straight back there, but there was like towards the end of high school, I, I found my, I found my people when my senior year, some friends and I got together and we started this thing at my school called R-A-K-E, Rake. Um, it was random acts of kindness, et cetera. We created it with the premise of every week, uh, how do we make time for the intentional practice of kindness? Uh, and so we had a big wooden garden rake. That was our mascot. And once a week we would get together and talk about kindness and why it was important, why the world needed more of it, why it was hard. Uh, and then the most important part of the club was we would leave the room and we had like a mission. It was less random and more intentional practices of kindness, but the only two goals were to meet someone new and leave them better than you found them. And we would talk about what that looked like. Like, how do you intentionally put yourself in that space of discomfort? Uh, and then like, how do you, how do you meet people where they're at in terms of what they need? Right. Because all of us give and receive love in different ways. So that was kind of what the club was all about. And that experience in high school for me was transformative in the sense of, um, that experience of giving kindness is always so profoundly rewarding that my life in many ways has become about figuring out how to, how to help other people experience the joy that comes from altruism, right? It comes yeah. from giving. Yeah, so yeah. the very first meeting, we bought two dozen donuts and we ate one. <laughs> and then we were supposed to go give uh, one to someone else. And we talked about like the distinction in happiness, the happiness that comes from like selfish, I'm going to eat this donut and it's going to be good for what the 30 seconds that I'm enjoying it versus the happiness that comes from like giving it away to someone and seeing that expression of like, what is this about? And that the exercise of kindness and realizing that the joy that comes from that is always more profound, always more permanent than selfish joy. So, uh, yeah, fast forward however many years later, um, I've been trying to figure out how to give out lots of donuts. How old were you when you started that? Donut was, thing. <laughs> the donut thing. Uh, 17. Wow. Okay. So yeah. you always kind of knew that it seems like you just wanted to do something really powerful to give back. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think like with most things in life, especially when you're doing good things, at some point it starts selfish. Mm-hmm. So that's been my journey is figuring out how to continue to detach, I don't know, my ego, my pride from the whole thing. One of my favorite quotes I've been thinking a lot about recently is, 
how much bigger our life gets when we make ourselves smaller in it. Uh, so the ongoing process for me, even in doing good work, we always have ulterior selfish motives. Um, and I think the ongoing, probably lifelong work is figuring out how do we, how do we continue to detach ourselves from expectations and from the need for recognition, uh, and from the need to make it all about you to, to like truly and generously give one of the things that we talk about a lot at character strong is what does it mean to serve the work? And serving the work is different than serving people because when we serve people, sometimes we have an expectation of what we get in return, right? We want gratitude or we want uh, appreciation versus serving the work, which is like the work is kindness. And sometimes you're kind to people and you don't always get it in return. And sometimes you're kind to people and you don't get a thank you or an acknowledgement. And sometimes we don't want to go back to that person or that thing because we don't feel appreciated in it. And in some ways, that's like the thing I wrestle with is how do I do this so selflessly that I don't need that and I can just show up and serve the work, the work of kindness, knowing that the work in and of itself is worthwhile without my ego involved. Yeah. I've got to ask, do you meditate? Like, are you spiritual? <laughs> do you use you know, head spaces? I love Because I had the yeah. founder, Andy, on this podcast. No way. Yeah, he's awesome. And yeah. I just feel like you're like a good like model for somebody who probably meditates and is just super zen all the time. I try to do some mindfulness stuff, uh, some reflection stuff. A lot of my work is like figuring out the process of self-reflection. I don't find myself super good at it yet. It's a skill I'm it's a, working It's a on. process, yeah, especially yeah. like learning to quiet your mind. Yeah, and Andy has that accent that yeah. makes him just wiser already. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's perfect. Well, I'm from a really small town in eastern Connecticut, and you're from Maine. So yeah. a lot of people ask me all the time, like, how did I kind of build what I built with no connections, nothing? And I always think coming from a small town, coming from not that crazy like LA or New York or Boston, mm. whatever, I think really shaped me as a person. But I'm curious from your perspective, you know, growing up in Maine, has that you think impacted your success now or given you a lot like of a deeper meaning when you moved to LA specifically? <laughs> yeah, Maine was, was, you know, formative. I think uh, growing up mostly like my main years were in Seattle, a small town outside of Seattle called Snohomish. And, uh, yeah, there's something about growing up in a space where, I mean, like the biggest occupation at the time was like farming and, um, again, talking about serving the work, growing up in like a family oriented, small town community kind of space was the best. I mean, it reminds you that this world and this life is about people. And sometimes we forget that like one of the things we talk about at Character Strong again is this idea that we manage things and we lead people. So sometimes we get caught up on like trying to lead people and it becomes very mm, transactional, right? Like we're trying to get something from someone always. Uh, and I feel like that can be the mindset of Los Angeles, which is as soon as I'm talking to you, that the energy, the mindset is what can I, what can you do for me? Uh, and when our attitude becomes transactional, um, I don't know. I think we reduce people to things. No, I agree. That's what I, I was saying before that I don't like about LA is I think it's it's only about certain things, followers, cars, parents, and whatnot. And I think that that distracts from everything somebody can be as a human being, right? Yeah. But with Character Strong, tell me, because you talk about a lot of different topics, right, mm -hmm. when you go into these schools. And I think it's really fascinating because so many kids right now are so confused. Faculty is so confused, especially when it comes to like social media and mental health. How did you come up with this curriculum mm -hmm. back in 2016? So one of the things that I've realized working with lots of students and educators, uh, specifically more of my work is with, with educators, counselors, administrators, you know, classroom teachers. And uh, it's profound to know that educators are walking out of college super prepared to teach their content area, but there's no direct training around how to teach behavior. And what the researcher data would show is that the average student today has as much anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the 1950s. Yeah, I've read that. Yeah, so as anxiety goes up, empathy naturally goes down, uh, which means like these, when we're talking mental health, what we're really talking about is not only a, a gap in wellness, like personal wellness, it's also a gap in like compassion, right? Because as I'm more and more worried about what's going on in my life, I have a harder time worrying about what's going on in yours. So... We're a big believer at Character Strong that if we don't help teachers learn how to teach social emotional skills, how to teach character, how to teach really in some ways behavior, then we're setting them up for failure in classrooms where 
actually like a lot of the work that they need to do in classrooms is less content area and more behavior. Why? Because, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have access to Wikipedia or Khan Academy or all these things that literally all the pieces of information in the world, any piece of curriculum that teachers could teach in those content areas is available. And I could learn at home in my pajamas any subject in my native language from some of the best educators in the world. So it's like one of our questions at Character Strong is, then why is school relevant anymore? And it's relevant because school is the only place you can show up and be in community with people. And what's what we're seeing in our world is as like this empathy gap that's being created. It's people are having a harder and harder time just being in a room with each other. Like we don't know how to interact. I think we're desperate for a connection, but we literally don't know what it looks like. And so if as educators, we don't take that opportunity to teach young people those things, then we're, we're missing out on what I think education literally needs to be about today, right? Like we still need to teach content, but I think the other half of teaching kids now is how do we teach people to be in community, how to agree to disagree, how to engage relationally, how to fill that empathy gap by helping people practice things like mindfulness, practice understanding what it, how to wrestle with anxiety. Because if I don't know how to regulate my emotions, like my friend Andrew Fuller out of Australia, in his research, he says that the number one indicator of fulfillment in life is the skill of emotional regulation, which is just that skill of like, do I know what I'm feeling? And when I'm feeling that feeling, can I still choose the things that I value and believe in instead of just constantly acting on my feelings? Because my feelings are like all over the place, right? And if I live based on my feelings, then I get myself in trouble. I, I act out of alignment with like who I want to be. So the number one indicator of fulfillment in life is it's like a, a social emotional skill. If we're not teaching that to kids, then we're setting them up to live, I mean, less fulfilled lives, right? So um, Character Strong was started in an attempt to help fill that gap and an attempt to help educators get back to like the work that I think all of us, you know, teachers specifically really want to be about, which is teaching young human beings and not just young test takers. You grew up a little bit at a different time than when I grew up because we've got a little bit of an age gap. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, social media when I was growing up wasn't even as big. And with you, because you're a few years older than me, it wouldn't have been really even as relevant as it is now. So mm-hmm. how do you think that social media is playing a part in like depression, anxiety, suicide, cutting, all of this stuff mm-hmm. that young adults are going through right now? Yeah, I think it's mostly... Uh, the anxiety of social media is one of exposure, right? Like the idea that uh, as I'm exposed, as I'm inundated with information, uh, I'm overwhelmed by information and my brain can't, (laughs) (laughs) my brain can't uh, handle all that information at once. Uh, We talk a lot about the idea of like, there's different kinds of happiness, right? This idea that um, in Latin, there's four words. The first word is latest. Latest is the happiness of things. So I see the pizza, I eat the pizza, I'm happy. But that happiness is really short-lived. And what social media does is it reduces people to things. You're not a human being. You're a follower. You're a retweet. You're a subscriber. And as we reduce people to things, we start to manipulate people. That's anxiety-inducing. The second level of happiness in Latin is Felix, which is the happiness by comparison. I have more than you, so I'm happy. Uh, And social media plays that game really well, (laughs) meaning uh, it puts us it visually shows us where we stand in the social ladder. So as I scroll through Instagram, I can see people who have more than me. I can see people who have less than me. And my brain is desperate to figure out how I stack up. And so the anxiety comes from scrolling through a feed and constantly playing the comparison game. And we all know, like, no one actually wins the comparison game, right? Someone's always going to have more. Someone's always going to have less. But the anxiety that's created by constantly playing that game, constantly figuring out where we measure up, um, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. And more than ever, it's constant. I have constant access to the comparison game. Whereas before it's only maybe when I show up in a certain place or an environment. Now it's 24 seven. Anytime I open an app, I unintentionally engage myself in that process. Um, and so we try to talk about, is there a different way to be happy? Because culture wants to convince us that it's a game, right? Culture wants to convince us that it's a competition, that if you have more X, you're going to be more happy than Y. And that never works. It works for the companies that are trying to sell us things to fill those voids. But we talk about like, what's the better, you know, what's the longer, more permanent, more profound happiness? 
one of my favorite words is beatitudo. Beatitude, I think it's like beautiful with an attitude. And beatitudo is the happiness that comes from seeing good in people and doing good for people. It's relational, right? I earn a relationship with you by spending time with you, by listening to you, by making you feel seen and heard, by giving you generosity or kindness. And in that moment of selflessness, your reaction, which, you know, it could be any number of things, but sometimes it's like joy or gratitude or connection. And the relationship that I form there and the happiness that I get from you when you tell me, hey, you just made my day, that, like, that's permanent. And you can't take that away from me. Um, the challenge is it's earned, meaning it doesn't come as quickly as a happy meal. It doesn't come as quickly as a like. It doesn't come as quickly as like, oh, I have more, I have better clothes than this person, more followers than this person. Right? The comparison game is so instant. The things that we buy or exchange are so fast. It's quick happiness, but it's not permanent happiness versus beatitudo, which is relational. And it's like, it's work to be with people, right? It's work to earn relationships and it's work to be in community with people because people can be frustrating and messy. We don't always agree and we don't always get what we expect in return from them. But that moment where someone says, wow, that was, thank you. Like that just made my day. Uh, one of my other favorite words is mudita. Mudita is a Sanskrit word. It means vicarious joy, meaning I'm happy because I see that you're happy. And there's something deeply joyful in that. Like, and Buddhists, it's a Buddhist, it's one of the four paths to enlightenment, right? It's like that pursuit of living a more selflessly happy life, meaning my life is happier as I create joy in others. Yeah. Uh, so the social media thing for me is a distraction in many ways from authentic relationships. And so we're substituting this comparison game for true connection. And we're being sold this false bill of goods that this comparison game is going to make us happy. Uh, and at some point, I think all of us are realizing this isn't working. Like I'm at home, I'm isolated, I'm lonely, I'm anxious, and I'm depressed. What's wrong? And we're scrolling through our Instagram and it's like, well, maybe this is what's wrong is we're never going to win this game. Um, and the longer, more challenging, but ultimately more fulfilling game is the exercise of kindness. Yeah. A lot of people who are listening might be thinking like, how did you be, this is such a silly question, but like, how did you become the kind of way that you are? I mean, you think very deeply, it seems compared to a lot of people who don't think as deeply, like you seem to like really analyze everything in life. And I think a lot of people just kind of glide by life or get so frustrated on social media mm -hmm. or in their, their jobs. And they want to pursue what they're doing on the side and they, they just can't get the mindset to do it. And it seems like you've put all of that into one. Um, so I don't know, how would you answer that question? Like, where do you think that your level of curiosity, I think about life came from? Mm. Uh, yeah, there's some quote about the unobserved life is like not worth living. Uh, and I think there's uh, honestly, um, I mentioned it earlier, but this like the skill of self-reflection feels fairly new to me personally. Uh, but it has been my job for the past eight years to figure out really like how do you communicate and explain and help people experience kindness in a rich and meaningful way. So in many ways, the deeper I get into this work, the more obsessed I become with, wait, why aren't we happy? Why aren't we doing this thing that we all know is worthwhile and important? And yet like there's a gap, right? There's a gap between what we believe in and what we actually exercise. There's a gap between what we say we value and, and how we actually show up and practice it in the world. And that's frustrating. And, and more recently I've become kind of uh, I suppose, obsessed with that question of not whether or not kindness is good or worthwhile. We all agree on that already. The better question is, then why don't we do it more? Um, and so trying to figure out tools to help people walk through that process of self-reflection. Um, I don't think I'm like personally good at self-reflection. I'm good at figuring out ways to structure self-reflection for others. And one of the quotes I think about a lot is like, wise people take their own advice. <laughs> and I, I try to take my own advice, but I think I'm better at dispensing. Most of us are better at dispensing it than actually living it. Um, but I think that's the question that I want to help people in the current phase of my life. That's the question I want to help people wrestle with is what's getting in my own way of living a life that's more observed, reflective. What's getting in my way of living a life that's more generous, more joyful, more kind, um, and for me, at least personally, it's come down to like a few things. For me, it's incompetence. 
which is to say, if I've never been taught it, if I don't know how to do a thing, sometimes I avoid that thing, right? I always use the example going to the gym. There's machines in the gym. I literally don't know what they do. And I will never get on them. Yeah. Why? Because they scare me. Like, I don't understand even what part of the body they work out. <laughs> same. I think the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what happens when we don't know how to do something? Well, we gravitate towards the things that we already know. And that's what makes the premise of kindness hard for most people is it's, it's just abstract enough that it doesn't live on our to-do list. The things on our to-do list, we know exactly how to do. I know how to do laundry. I know how to write emails. I know how to post a gram. Like, these are things that we know how to do because they're very practical and they're, they're tangible. Whereas kindness for most people is abstract enough that it never ends up on our to-do list. So we don't fit it into our day. We become busy and we become stressed and we become anxious. And so one of the things I want to help with Character Strong and with Choose Love is how do we teach the competencies of kindness? Because if we, never, if we don't understand how to do a thing, then we'll just continue to do the things that we already know. Um, and one of the things I think about with kindness is it's, it actually requires a lot of skills. Like kindness, we, sometimes we make kindness seem fluffy, right? Like I hate the quote that we should throw kindness around like confetti. I think that's like, it's, uh, it's diminishing of what kindness actually is. Kindness is really hard when you're practicing it like unconditionally. Um, and the idea that it's supposed to be thrown around like confetti re- reduces it to something that's simple. And the reality is, if it's that simple, then why don't more people do it? <laughs> so uh, underneath kindness are the skills of empathy, the skills of active listening, the skills of resilience, the skill of, of like growth mindset. Like, can I grow in my capacity for compassion? And all these skills that live underneath kindness, if we don't teach those things, whether it's in school or out of school, then most of us are incompetent, even unconsciously, at kindness. And so we'll avoid kindness in pursuit of the more tangible things on our to-do list. So for me, it's like incompetence. It's insecurity, which is like if I'm scared of a thing, I avoid that thing. And for me, there's lots of things that I'm afraid of that get in the way of my practice of kindness. Like I'm scared of getting laughed at by people. I'm scared of getting rejected or judged by people. I'm scared of failing. I'm scared of uh, people thinking I'm weird. And so any number one of those fears will prevent me from practicing kindness with people, right? I I try to keep myself safe um, to protect myself from the pain of rejection. And like the reality of kindness, the thing that they don't tell us enough in school is kindness is usually painful. Like you'll practice kindness and you won't always get back what you want. You won't always get a compliment in return. You won't always get appreciation. And most of us, when we experience pain, we're like, screw that, I'm not doing that again. Uh, And the last one for me, so it's incompetence, insecurity, and inconvenience. And inconvenience is the big one, which is most of the time we don't feel like it, right? Like kindness requires a sacrifice almost always of time or energy or money or pride or ego. And most of the time I'm, I'm tired. (laughs) I'm hungry. I'm sad. I'm anxious. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'm any number one of those like thousands of emotions that we feel every day, especially in a place like LA where we have pressure to whatever it is. And when I'm feeling anxious or tired or sad or hungry, those emotions don't lend themselves to kindness. Like when I'm hungry, I'm not as kind of a person. When I'm exhausted, I'm not as kind of a person. And if I don't honor the fact that I'm feeling some of those things, and if I'm not conscious of how those things get in the way of my practice of kindness, then I'm just going to continue to live my life based on what I feel. And as we look around our country, most of us are exhausted and anxious and lonely. <laughs> so when you feel like that, any of those, you personally, what do you do? I mean, when you're lonely, anxious, depressed, I don't know, stressed out, mm-hmm. what do you do first? Uh, I'm working on honoring Love those Love that feelings. you're saying that you're not like 100% already perfect outside of it because no. nobody's perfect. Uh, yeah, I got a lot of work to do on this stuff, but I'm working on first like honoring that feeling, which is allowing myself to experience it in the first place, not just like push it aside in pursuit of the next thing. Um, I have a tendency to be always moving forward. And sometimes when we're like forward momentum, we don't always experience fully what we're feeling. So the morning I woke up and I was like, "Hmm, I feel lonely. And to like sit in that for a while, as opposed to just getting out of bed and like going to check my email. um, I'm challenging myself to let myself feel those things more often. 
Because if we don't let ourselves feel it, it, then we don't understand it. And if we don't understand it, it's hard to improve at it. Um, another one of my favorite quotes is, if we don't understand the purpose of a thing, we'll abuse that thing. So if we don't let ourselves understand loneliness, then we'll never improve at it. So first, honor it. Uh, and then the second thing that I, I try to f ask myself the question is um, like a simple inequality. Is my fight bigger than my feelings? Meaning is what I'm trying to do in this world bigger than me? If it's not, then my feelings are always going to dictate my actions. If my fight is bigger than my feelings, if I can make that thing that I'm pursuing, that thing that I'm like passionate about, if I can make it bigger than myself and I can align myself to that, not all the time, not with perfection, but more often I can align myself to my fight than just what I feel on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's a big deal, right? Like I'm going to pursue people and I'm going to pursue kindness even though I don't feel like it because I've articulated, I've written down, I've said out loud, I believe in this thing. And this thing is so big and worthwhile that even though I'm tired, I got work to do. Even though I'm sad or angry or lonely, I can still feel those things. But even in those feelings, I can choose to practice kindness. Um, and that's that skill I was talking about earlier. That's emotional regulation. I know how I'm feeling. I understand it. I'm allowed to feel that thing. And then I can choose to live based on what I believe in instead of just based on what I feel. And at Character Strong, we talk about that as true freedom. The freedom not just to live based on your feelings, which if we live based on our feelings, we're in a prison of our own making. We're constantly controlled by our emotions, which don't always lead us in the way that we want to go. So we honor those emotions, and then they say, you know what, I got work to do over here that's more important or bigger than this present emotion. So again, I don't do it with perfection, but I, I probably on a daily basis have to remind myself that this work is in some capacity, I believe, worthwhile and bigger than my own personal pettiness or whatever it is. I also feel like, um, in general, the process of kind of self-love and learning mm. to be mentally okay as a process, like it's not something that happens overnight or even a period of like 10 years. Mm. But so specifically, I guess, with anxiety and depression, because I talk a lot about that and it seems like a lot of your programs focus on similar topics. Uh, I mean, are you telling people like to sit in their anxiety, to sit in their sadness and just like embrace it? Is that because people who like don't, like wouldn't think that, oh, you should sit and be anxious or, oh, you should sit and be sad, but that's what you're saying to do, kind of? Yeah, I think, I don't think that's the only thing to do. You know, there are some situations where you need an objective person, which is why something like therapy or some of these apps that give you space to talk or share or finding a friend, some someone who uh, you've built trust with that you can talk to is um, is always that first or second step, right? Um so I don't want to diminish it by saying, you just got to sit in your anxiety and then you'll figure it out. But I do think it's okay to, right, emotional regulation would say that I can identify my anxiety and then um, there's a part of me that has put in the work over time to observe what I'm feeling, to name it, and to be okay with it in some capacity. Like, I know that what I'm feeling, I, I, I just read a meme, I think I read it this morning, that like anxiety are like conspiracy theories we tell ourselves. And it's actually something we talk about at Character Strong is we talk about the four big lies. And these lies that we tell ourselves, not intentionally, but because cultures told them to us over and over again. And at some point we start to believe they're true. For example, if I'm not perfect, I'm not enough. Right, this like performance anxiety, this idea that we have to achieve in order to feel worthy in our life is something that culture convinces us of every day. If you're not successful, then you're not good enough. So if you're not productive, you're not worthy. And that's been like my life for the past couple of years. I've been so concerned with being successful that I've sacrificed relationships and friendships because I'm worried about my to-do list more than I'm worried about my relationships. And that's the truth is my worth is inherent, right? I'm a human being, not a human doing. And yet I get caught up all the time with all the things that I have to do. Um, so if I can separate, I can honor my anxiety. I feel anxious that I have so much to do. I'm, I don't feel successful. I'm not productive today. And I can experience that anxiety and at the same time have the emotional intelligence to say, 
I know I'm feeling this right now. And the truth is this conspiracy theory, this lie that I'm telling myself is that if I'm not perfect, I'm not worthy. And I can look around and see lots of friends who struggle with the same thing. And the way that I would speak to them and the way that I would love on them is so different than the way I speak to myself. I love Dr. Brene Brown, one of my favorite authors and speakers. She says we need to more often speak to ourselves like we speak to our friends. And so, yeah, the conversation around self-care is obviously critical, right? If I don't know how to take care of myself, if I don't have a full tank, I'm, I'm never going to overflow towards other people. And the reality, just like any of these other stuff in our life, that this is a daily practice, something that we never perfect, something that we never figure out. But over time, we improve if we make the space and time for it. And that's kind of the premise of Character Strong. It's the premise of Choose Love. Is this idea that relationally healthy people, emotionally healthy people, make time. Because you're never going to find time. But they make time for the, for the practice of self-care. They make time for the practice of compassion. They make time for the practice of character. Because if we don't make time, we will never have the time. Right? Because... Culture is going to tell us to be busy with everything else. And so a lot of the premise of what we do is how do we help schools and how do we help individuals create space in their day to make this work a priority? Because ultimately, like we know in our heart of hearts that like love and the relationships and kindness and the communities that we build are more important than our paychecks. They're more important than our job titles and more important than our followers. But we are constantly distracted. And my friend John, my co-founder in Character Strong and my personal hero, my favorite thing he says is we need to be reminded more than we need to be taught. I think that's brilliant because I need reminders of this stuff daily that like that this is the real work of living is to figure out the real work of loving. Yeah. That to-do list too, in general, whether you're an entrepreneur or not can also be so overwhelming. Cause mm-hmm. I think that's when you start sacrificing, especially when you're an entrepreneur, like you start sacrificing relationships and things and all these different events and occasions is because you get so caught up in the thing you feel like you have to do. But when you think about it, or when I've had moments like that, which is a lot, then I think <laughs> all that whole to-do list is things I've given myself. So mm-hmm. everyone's off living their life, not thinking about their to-do list, but I don't know what it is that especially entrepreneurs get so caught up in that personal to-do do list that it really um doesn't allow them like us to sometimes have those relationships and whatnot and I don't know why do you think that that is is it something specifically about quote-unquote type a entrepreneurs that we're so in that go 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 mindset all the time I think it's I think most of the lies that we live are culturally given to us so the example I would use like in our present world is the hustle culture right? That everything's a side hustle and everything's a hustle. And when we're so focused on the hustle, um, because we see our friends do it, because we see culture telling us that this is the thing, uh, we get anxiety when we're not hustling. And the reality of something like kindness or patience or self-love, uh, it's not quote unquote traditionally productive. It's not what culture would tell us is successful. It's not always going to necessarily make us money or profit or increase our follower count. And so if we don't see the tangible result of something in our current culture, we feel like it's not worthwhile. And uh, so I guess the challenge that Choose Love or or Character Strong tries to help frame, and, and really in many ways the challenge of living, is can I observe what culture tells me? And do I personally in any way have a filter that I put culture through? Because if I don't, then... I'm going to live the life that culture tells me to, which the only reason culture tells me to do most things is because uh, culture is typically generated out of scarcity, fear, and uh, in the U.S., like capitalism, right? So culture wants to sell us something so people can make money. Culture wants us to feel afraid so that... um, we feel like we need more things in our life to feel whole and culture wants to tell us like there's not enough to go around because when we create competition, people can sell us something. And so a lot of our culture specifically operates on that paradigm. And if we're not conscious to that, then our life is dictated by something that is arbitrarily being given to us. And that's sort of a silly way to live your life is on the whims of people who ultimately are trying to make money off of you. Um, 
And so the, the question that, you know, is, I think is worthwhile to ask ourselves is, do we have any filter that we put culture through? Um, I know this is the unfiltered life, but like unfiltered conversation, mm-hmm. I think we need filters in our brain, in our hearts, in our lives to determine who do I listen to? Why do I listen to them? And if I don't have answers to those questions, it starts to help remind myself that maybe a lot of my life, my life is being lived on lies that I was convinced of for no other reason than to benefit someone else. And so if you want to talk about like fearless living, if you want to talk about courageous living, it, it looks like a life that has been intentionally designed by you to take ownership over the culture that you want to live in. If there's something about this culture that you don't like or, or that you think is, is worth being different, then you got to do something different. And you have to challenge the way culture presents it to you if you're ever going to show up in, in a way that's, that's courageous. Um, I don't know what the original question was, but I think that, I think that culture dictates a lot of what we do. And I think that, um, hopefully the tools that I want to help create for people are tools that help create worthwhile filters in their life. So they live more free. So they live more compassionately and they live in a way that is, uh, ultimately more healthy. Yeah. The question was like type yeah. A hustle culture yeah, yeah. and we get that dictated to us and it's like, pause, chill out for a second is this the anxious life that I want to live or is there something different and more worthwhile? Mm -hmm. And if there is the cool part about life is like, I get to determine that for me. Yeah. I've read a lot of different studies about specifically like the Gary V, the hustle, like that it doesn't positively uh, impact young people because they get so caught up with this. I don't know. I think it's kind of obnoxious, this obsession with like hustling. And I think when you actually have a company like you and I have been doing this for a while, so we've gotten adjusted to like what our regular schedule has to be and whatnot. But I think it's specifically like 2017 to to now, to early now, 2019, this obsession with like finding this side hustle, the side thing, and then you have to put everything in it. And like, you have to have no friends. You have to drink 20 cups of black coffee a day and like (laughs) then become a famous Instagrammer. And I just look at these kids and I'm like, this is not what it's supposed supposed to be. It's not supposed mm-hmm. to be about all of this, but what do you think about that? I mean, specifically him, um, cause I know a lot of people have great things to say about him and I've never read his book, but there's also, I think a lot of negativity around that word hustle and that mm-hmm. negative obsession with like never stopping at all to just take a moment and breathe. Yeah. You know, uh, success is such a personal definition. So if, if Gary's version of success is how he describes it, then he, and, and other people believe that definition of success, then he's a great teacher. Um, and I would never presume to give people their personal definition of success. Uh, so if that is your definition, I guess that the question that's worth asking though, is like, is that your true definition of success? And if it is, who gave you that definition? Where did it come from? Is it a byproduct of your exposure to culture or is it something that you wrestled with internally and said, no, this is really, this is what I want to be about. And some people love that feeling of like adding to the world of doing something productive for many people. It's anxiety inducing and exhausting and, uh, actually relationship ruining. So, um, again, it's like the cool part of life is that we get to determine that for ourselves, but the, but do we have the tools to effectively ask ourselves mm-hmm. that question? What is my definition of success and where did it come from? My friend Kyle, he's a great uh, speaker, works in schools and conferences, and he's one of my personal creative heroes. He's like brilliant. His brain just operates different. And I was visiting him recently, and he said, you know, he said, my definition of success is the number of nights I come home smelling like campfire. And I was like, what a cool metric. It's like instead of my, my profit – right? Instead of my annual revenue. So the number of engagements I have on my calendar, instead of inbox zero or inbox 1000, instead of the number of followers I have, he's like one of my metrics that he tracks, <laughs> you know, it's like number of days I come home to like campfire. And it's like, that's awesome. I love that. And most people don't have metrics like that because they've been convinced that success looks like this thing. And so, you know, 
where you're recording what your success looks like and have you articulated it to yourself? Have you articulated it to other? How do you hold yourself accountable to that definition of success? Because we need to be reminded more than we need to be taught and culture is always going to tell us a different version. So unless we have accountability for ourselves and from others and we've said out loud or we put a space like number of days I come home, smell like campfire, um, then we're always going to lean towards what culture tells us. So I've been thinking about that a lot for me personally. Uh, is success based on the number of schools I'm working in or the number of people in the audience or the number of money, amount of money that I make? Um, or does success look like to me the number of nights I'm home playing game nights with my friends? The number of nights I get to make dinner for myself or for others? The number of mornings I wake up and get to do yoga with friends? Um, to me, those are, have become more of my metrics. Uh, and the other stuff's important, right? I don't want to diminish productivity. I don't want to diminish work ethic because both of those things are worthwhile and we need people who are working their butts off towards good things in the world. But uh, it's all held in balance with with our, our personal definition of what it means to be fulfilled. I like the word work ethic more so than hustle because yeah. I think that hustle, like now the word entrepreneur has just gotten so saturated. Mm -hmm. But I think you and I could both agree and I, and I wish more people successful entrepreneurs talked about this, that specifically when it comes to financial stability after being a quote unquote starving artist for X amount of years at the beginning, you'll get there if you work so hard and you hustle for a long period of time and then you get there and it's like, what's next? So it's mm. the 1% of entrepreneurs that get to that whatever money mark they had in their head. And then if you're able to get over that and you're like, what really truly does bring you happiness? That's what I think is like the key to being a successful entrepreneur. Cause mm. when you get to that mark, what else is after that? Right. Uh, yeah. So I think you're the perfect example of that. There's so much more than those certain goals that society puts on us, especially, but tell me when you go into these schools specifically, like what is the curriculum that you guys are teaching? And more importantly, you're talking more so to faculty, right? How is that changed your perspective on maybe what teens are dealing with or what schools could be doing better. Because so many faculty members, when I would go into schools and when I go into schools are so confused about social media, they don't understand why like bullying and Instagram and all of that. So how do you navigate teaching that? Uh, educators, you know, the interesting thing about education is it's so sprawling and all of us are going to get exposed to it at some point. So educators who come from all around the world, uh, and they show up to the same building. Let's say it's a, a school that has a hundred staff. And what you don't realize, you know, if you, if you don't have the conversation, most educators show up with a slightly different paradigm of what education is supposed to be. And so here's all these people showing up to the same building, trying to do slightly different types of work. And that is like cool. And you know, that premise that like, we all have like a diverse opinion as to what this thing's about is like, simultaneously beautiful and confusing and I think sometimes a problem in schools. When we work with educators, one of our first goals is to give people a common language and the schools that implement our work most successfully, like that's what they say makes a huge difference is if we're speaking the same language, we can work towards a common goal together and it changes everything. So um, when working with teachers, our, our goal is to equip them with like, what does this act, like, what does education mean? And we don't have to all agree personally, but we should come to some consensus as to what we're trying to do as a school. Because if we're, if we don't, especially when it comes to social emotional learning or when it comes to character, like then we're, we're aiming towards different targets and then kids are getting different experiences and there's not consistency. Um, and when there's not consistency, there's not sustainable real change. So one of our first conversations is like, what is culture? What is climate? Like culture and climate in your building, what do those things actually look like? We talk about, you know, sometimes kindness is this, it's looked at as this fluffy thing. And we have like a kindness week and we throw kindness around like confetti. But do we have a shared paradigm that like kindness is actually harder than it looks? And these are the skills that you need to teach in order to effectively have kind students at your school. It, you know, we have like kindness weeks at school and the paradigm that kids are supposed to show up and know what that behavior is, I think is, uh, is unintentional. Meaning there are a number of kids that show up to every school who want to be kind, but they have no idea what kindness looks like because they don't go home and have a role model of kindness in their life. And so now they're showing up to school expecting to be something that they don't see. And you can maybe imagine the internal frustration from a, a young kid, like a 14-year-old, who's being told to be kind. And they're like, I literally don't know how to do it. 
And then they get in trouble for not doing something well that they've never seen or had a role model do in the first place. And so, you know, when working with educators, it's like, do we have a shared paradigm that behavior is a skill? And behavior is something that's taught at home, not always effectively. And if we want students to behave with kindness in school, then we need to have a shared understanding of what kindness actually looks like. And we need to have a shared common mission of how to actually approach it systematically, right? For every student, what does it look like to equip young people with the skills of kindness or empathy or connection or all these things that we want them to be and we say it, like, let's have a kindness assembly, but we don't explicitly teach it. So that's what our curriculum is trying to do is give teachers the skills and the tools to weave this conversation in to the daily fabric of their classroom. Like even if I'm a math teacher, how do I still weave kindness into the conversation? Um, and so we, we try to give tools to make that happen. How many schools are you in right now? Uh, I've worked with 600 schools. Okay. Like, Just in the U.S.? Uh, also, I did my first assembly in Uganda this okay. summer, um, Mexico, Canada. Um, some of our curriculum is being put into schools in, um, in Asia, like abroad. We have some in Japan and China. Um, are schools paying you? Like, do they find you or you pitch them? And then are like, especially with the talks that you've done, I mean, as like a public speaker, speaker, um, I mean, are, are people reaching out to you? Like, we're going to fly you here. Or do you choose like pick and choose where you want to go and just pay for it out of pocket? Yeah, a little bit of both. So my career has been built on Conan O'Brien's philosophy of like work hard and be kind and amazing things will happen. So most of the work for many years has been inbound. So people just hear, hey, I had this guy in my school. He was good. Kids liked him. And the name mm-hmm. gets passed on. Uh, more recently, especially as we started Character Strong, um, we've been really intentional about being on certain stages because we know that if we can connect with a counselor group or an administrative group or superintendents, then our impact looks different. Uh, so we've been really proactive about trying to be on stages in front of uh, administrators or counselors or uh, people like directors of curriculum or instruction, because we know that if we can get in front of them, then they can go and go back to their schools and, and put this curriculum into action, right? Like the systemic change versus the individual change. Uh, so Character Strong is now working with um, over 500 schools around the world. Uh, we've trained um, nearly 2,000 educators uh, and more when we go to their schools. Um, you also have a team to... of people. So it's not yeah. like you're taking this all on, like you've, you're dividing and conquering, right? Yeah, equip other people to teach the message is the goal for the past couple of years and moving forward. Um, yeah, many hands make light work for sure. Yeah. Oh, my. I'm just so incredibly impressed by you and all of these companies and whatnot. I mean, what what do you like? What's your day to day? Because I think <laughs> you could be considered a public speaker, an entrepreneur. You have two companies. You're also like kind of an Instagrammer. So what's like a day to day in your life? Is there one thing that you do every day that stays consistent? Is every day different? Yeah. uh, No, consistency is something I'm working on because I think pieces of it are healthy. Um, But I also like the freedom uh, and the the weirdness of my day-to-day life. So as an example, um, this morning, I met with a really lovely uh, French woman named Magali, uh, who, Magali? I think Magali. uh, She's doing a PhD studying the different words for love which is something I talk about. So we talked about that and we talked about how our lives uh, overlap. On my drive here, I talked to my co-founder, John, about our first webinar that we have coming up and the content that will go in that. I get to be here with you this morning and I drive from here to the airport to fly to Wenatchee, uh, where tomorrow in Washington, I'll work with a school in the morning and then I'll work with uh, the Hay Growers Association in the afternoon. I'll drive with John back to the other side of the state. Uh, We'll film a video for some digital content And then I'll fly to D.C. to speak at the Character.org conference. What's your advice for any entrepreneur who's listening who is struggling with finding balance? Ooh, yeah. Again, wise people take their own advice. Uh, the, The balance, I think, is a natural byproduct of determining what success looks like for you and then having accountability and discipline to stay true to that definition of success, meaning literally last year is the first year that I said, I'm only going to work this number of days at these types of events, put it on a calendar and the discipline to say no to things that seem like a quote unquote good idea at the time, but you've already reached your limits that you've self-imposed. Um, that's my ongoing work, right? Last year I said, I'm only going to do 75, ended up doing 90. 
this next year. I'm like, I'm only going to do 60. And I'm trying to get more disciplined at saying no to the things that I know allows me to say yes to other things in my mm-hmm. life. Because my definition of success has changed. It says my success looks like being home on certain days of the week. It looks like having opportunities to have these types of conversation, these types of meals, this smell of campfire. And if that is my true definition of success, then it makes it makes my ability to say no rooted in something I believe in. It's not just no arbitrarily. It's I say yes based on this criteria. And if it doesn't meet that criteria, I have not only like articulated why I'm saying no, you know, uh, logically, but I can also feel good about it internally because I'm clear and excited about my personal definition of success. So I can no to, say no to potential customers being like, I'm really sorry, but X, Y, and Z doesn't meet the criteria right now. Maybe in the future we could do A, B, or C. And then internally I get to like celebrate being like, I'm only going to be on the road 60 days. And it gives me opportunities to pursue the relationships and the community and the balance that I really love mm-hmm. that I've articulated to myself. So you're 29 now. So where do you see yourself in 10 years or five years? Dang, who knows? <laughs> What's your ultimate goal? Uh my goal is to live a life that is uh, rich with community and uh, as, as, many, as many points along the way as I can, rich with generosity and impact. Um, so I, I've been told that to think five years out is overwhelming in some ways. I hate it. Yeah, I hate it. It's my favorite question to ask entrepreneurs, <laughs> but I won't ask it to myself. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think my life changes Daily and certainly annually. I think it's Bill Gates says you, you underestimate what you can do in a day and or you overestimate what you can do in a day and you underestimate what you can do in a year um, or 10 years. Um, and I think that's true for me. My life has changed so much in the past year that I don't even know where I'm going to be in 2019. Um, but to, you know, in some ways, honor the question, uh, I want to be in a place where I am making a consistent impact uh, in education and in personal development around the topics of character, compassion, and love. And I want to be doing that work with people that I love and admire. Gosh, you are quite an inspirational person. I know you have a flight to catch, so <laughs> yeah. I'm going to stop us here. I got to get you. I-, I can't wait to see where you are in five years, even two years. Um <laughs> You, you're just amazing. So where can everyone find you on social media and all of your companies too? Yeah, all this stuff. Uh, yeah, you said I'm a pseudo Instagrammer, which is, yeah, like kind of, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. You're thing, an Instagrammer. But, uh, you, yeah. you can say it. You're allowed uh, to. At Houston Craft. So Houston, like the city. Uh, craft with a K, like the mac and cheese. I was really hoping you were from Houston when people sent me your Instagram. Oh, I do love mac so and cheese. Sense. Yeah, so me that's, too. Yeah. <laughs> so it just makes sense. Yeah. So Houston Craft is my personal. Um, you can find out more about Character Strong at characterstrong.com. And then my most recent venture, which is more in like the millennial space, which is chooselove.org, uh, which is how we take this idea of love and make it more practical in our life. So Character Strong and ChooseLove.org. Those are the places you can find me. And I don't know. And at schools, right? When you're doing your school yeah, talks. You might wander into a random middle school and find me there too. Well, thank you for being here. I hope you guys loved that episode. Um, check out everything he's doing. I mean, we're almost at 50 episodes here and I... Um, I'm so inspired by everyone and and feel so empowered after every interview, especially this one. So check out everything he's doing, follow everything. And I think also you would agree with like following people on your social media feeds who make an impact in your life. Mm -hmm. Cause instead of going through social media and feeling bad about yourself, you, it's so easy to make yourself feel good about yourself, Mm. right? By following somebody like you or hopefully me or any (laughs) of these other people out there. Um, but yeah, that's a wrap you guys. We'll see you next week, almost at 50 episodes. So send me who you guys would want to hear on for 50 or potentially even 100 and i'll keep that in mind have an awesome rest of your week and talk to you guys soon bye